Next up, uh, we are going to have uh, a live discussion with myself and the other members of our Apollo uh, mobile team about what's happening with the Apollo mobile SDKs and answering your most pressing questions about what we're doing. So if you're interested in asking a question, uh, shoot it right into that Twitch chat. Uh, I'll be throwing questions to the rest of the panel throughout. So speaking of the panel, let's see if we can go to the Brady Bunch view for uh, some introductions. Let's see. All right. So uh, I have already introduced myself, uh, so I'm going to have uh, folks go around. So uh, let's start with uh, Martijn. Martijn, why don't you uh, introduce yourself? Hi, um, I'm uh, Martijn uh, Martin uh, Walraven. I um, have been um, working at Apollo for quite a few years, um, and um, I uh, designed the uh, the first version of uh, Apollo iOS um, before uh, Ellen took over, um, maintaining the project. Um, and um, so a lot of the things that are in there today um, are things um, you could blame me for and uh, are things that um, we're working. Uh... And I do. <laughs> so um, yeah, I mean, it's been great to see so many people using it, um, hearing um, what they like, what they don't like. And I'm, I'm looking forward to um, getting some more questions about um, what we have been doing and what we plan on doing. Excellent. Uh, let's see, uh, going going uh, clockwise, let's go to Anthony. <laughs> All right, thanks, Ellen. Hi, guys, my name's Anthony. I just recently joined the Apollo GraphQL team, so I'm really excited to be here. I'm still ramping up and learning a ton, so I hope that I learn as much as everyone else watching today, honestly. Um, but I've used Apollo uh, at Salesforce at my last job, and before that, I worked at Facebook, so I've gotten a lot of experience using GraphQL, and I'm really excited to be part of this team building awesome GraphQL tools for the future. Awesome, I'm really excited to have Anthony on board as well. Um, Marta. Last but not least. Hello, everyone. Uh, so my name is Martin. Uh, I joined from France, uh, from Paris. Uh, and I'm working on the Apollo Android project. So I joined Apollo a bit more than six months ago to work uh, full time on Apollo Android. I do Android for like a long time, I think since uh, Cupcake. Uh, and I'm also uh, in the staff of, of uh, Android Makers. So uh, if you happen to be in France or if you have been to uh, one of the Android Makers edition, uh, chances are that our paths crossed. So yeah, I love everything Kotlin. I love everything Android. And I'm super happy to be here today. Excellent. Uh, so thanks, everybody, for introducing yourselves. Um, and uh, I will keep an eye on the, the chat for some questions. Um, Martin, let me start with you, because I know uh, we've got some pretty big changes that may be coming up for Apollo Android 3.0. Do you want to talk a little bit about uh, what's going on with that dev branch and, and how things are going? Yep, uh, excellent question. And I saw the, the question was in the chat as well uh, earlier. Um, so right now we are in a state where we have Apollo 2, I think the current version is 2.5.2, something like this. And uh, it, it has a long history. Apollo uh, 2.5 is uh, mostly, it has mostly uh, Java grounds. Um, so uh, right now it still has something like 50% 50, 50 Java. So uh, we, we worked a lot to make it nice to be usable from Kotlin. Uh, so we have an artifact to, uh, to use coroutines together with Apollo Android. Um, but the fact is that behind the scenes, uh, everything is still a callback API. Um, so we, we really want, uh, we would like to make Apollo Android Kotlin first and 100% Kotlin. And doing that meant breaking a lot of like the internal APIs, of course, but it also meant that uh, some of the external APIs uh, were going to change, obviously, uh, because it's not callback based anymore, but more like coroutine based. So yeah, we, we started, I don't know, uh, a few months back, we've made a, a ton of progress there. I think uh, the dev branch is mostly Kotlin now. Uh, so we, we took everything uh, converted to Kotlin. Um, and most of it is also Kotlin multi-platform. So I, I can talk later about this. But um, yeah, it's a, it's a huge progress. Uh, it, it, was a, it was and it still is a, a lot of work. Uh, but we're doing progress. And I hope that we can, uh, we can ship something this year. 
Awesome. Uh, and that's going to be Apollo Android version 3.0. Is that correct? Oh, yeah. So yeah. Uh, so current cool. one is 2.5. Next one is 3.0. Cool. Um, yeah. Related related question that we just got uh, from Sharplet is: uh, Do we have any plans to release uh, 1.0 for iOS? Uh, and as much as I love having the license to break everything all the time of uh, a 0.x uh, 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 API, we are planning on that. Um, I know that um, Anthony and I uh, and and uh, Martin as uh, Martin as well have have been. Uh, talking about that pretty extensively. Um, I know that we've got a general roadmap for what we want to do. Um, I'm hopeful that we can get that out by the end of the year. Um, and I, you know, hopefully even sooner than that, but um, we're, we're definitely excited about getting things to a point where um, uh, things are really stable and we have a better, um, a, a, a better, um, uh, uh, platform to build on than I think we do right now. Um, and I think, uh, we've got, we've got a lot of work to do, but, uh, that's part of why we now have Anthony as well. Um, Anthony or Martin, do either you want to chime in on that one? Martin, you want to, do you have anything you want to say about that? I've got a lot of plans for the roadmap. Uh, I know I've been talking to Ellen about, <laughs> um, sure. So, you know, we are really working on figuring out a better way to do generation and caching right now. I think that before we can get to a 1.0 version, the, the most important thing for a 1.0 version is stability of the API. So we want to make sure that when we add new functionality and features going forward after 1.0, we aren't making breaking changes too often, right? Because when you go when, once you have a 1.0, breaking changes mean you have to go to 2.0. So right now we're trying to figure out a better format for the generated um, response data and a API for caching that is really clean and flexible that allows us to add all of the features that we are looking to forward to in the future in a way that doesn't break things. So we're just going through a lot and thinking through a lot of how do we build these things in a way that's flexible, reusable, uh, easy for us to make additions and changes without breaking things. And I think that we, you know, we're making a lot of good progress on that. Um, and hopefully we'll have a a roadmap or some sort of proposal to put up to the community soon so they can see kind of what we're working on um, more transparent. Cool. Um, there's a fairly specific question here. We've got, are there any plans or existing ways for Android to use custom data classes instead of the auto-generated ones, like kind of like retrofit is the question. So uh, Martin? Yeah, I was reading that one. Uh, that's a tough one. Um, <laughs> uh, it's not easy. Um, because uh, historically we, we've resisted that because uh, it opens a lot of uh, a lot of maintenance uh, issues uh, because the code gen is pretty complex and uh, if uh, we open the possibility for users to uh, plug their own classes uh, it means every time we make one change uh, to the code gen it means potentially breaking uh, everybody's uh, classes, which we don't really want. And I don't think users want that as well. So um, yeah, w w I mean, maybe maybe one day, but uh, I, I think it's not very likely in the near future. Uh, another maybe answer to that question is that usually it's uh, better to separate domains and have uh, a, a clear separation between your network models, which would be the generated one, and your uh, models uh, in, in your app. Like most of the time, people want to do this because they want to slap some room annotations or something like this to store the models in a, in a database. Uh, but then it brings a lot of uh, questions. Like if you change the models, uh, you, you will have to do a database migration. And uh, if you use the network yeah. uh, model for that, it's not going to end up very well. So, so it's, a, it's a complex problem. Uh, I'm not saying no, but uh, it raises a lot of uh, other questions. Yeah, yeah that, I think it this is, is a really complex issue. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Alan. Yeah, I, I was going to say this is something. There's 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 a related question about iOS and Codable. We are looking at Codable support um, for a number of reasons. I think Codable is a little bit different just in terms of how that that works, uh, in, in terms of how it interacts with the with the system versus uh, using your own um, classes. I think one thing that we've seen a lot on iOS is people um, sort of 
using our models uh, to sort of start powering a view model that uh, is is more tightly tied to uh, whatever view is actually being um, displayed. Uh, but I think it's it's definitely something where um, you know. Uh, there is some coupling between the structure of the return data and the structure of the the generated code. So I think that's that's something to be aware of. Um, and I think it's it's something where um, different different apps that we've worked with um, have taken different approaches to it. Some of them will sort of really form their their queries uh, so that each query really winds up creating a view model. Uh, but some of them will, uh, do tons of mapping into their own view models um, from the the types that they get back from uh, the the API. So uh, that's that's definitely uh, a big a big thing that we've seen. Uh, Anthony, I know you've you've worked uh, quite a bit as a as a consumer of uh, the Apollo API. What's what's your take on that one? Yeah, um, so I did use the Apollo client quite a lot, and I found that the generated. Um, response data structs that we create for you from your queries oftentimes are excellent and oftentimes are not exactly the, the structure of the data that we want. I, know, I saw that, you know, Adam just posted in the chat that in Kotlin, they like to extend um, or adapt and, and create their own view models that they, they then transform the data from our generated structs into. And I think that that's actually something that we did a lot at Salesforce. And I think is probably a good uh, practice for people as well, because the, the way that we have to regenerate the response data is so complicated with dealing with all the different typecasting um, and dealing with all of the, the structure of the actual GraphQL queries or permutation operations. It doesn't really give you a way to consume the data the exact way that you want to in your view controllers. So um, as we're redoing the code gen, I think we're trying to think of ways to make our view models more and more useful. And I, I saw some questions about um, codable there. And yes, we're trying to make the new version of the code gen create codable response data um, structures. But I, I still think that at the end of the day, there's going to be a lot of value in taking the structs we have and adapting them to your own view models to make them very specific to your view controllers. Um, I, I found that you can make your view controller logic a lot more expressive and a lot more readable when you define your data and structure it in a way that really fits exactly what your intent and aim is at that moment. And it's really hard for us to generate, you know, response data structs that are going to fit everyone's individual use case per perfectly. Um, so one thing that I've been thinking about, and I don't want to make any promises here, but one of my thoughts has been that maybe we create some way to adapt, to, to inject your own adapters so that the Apollo client creates the response data structure, you inject some adapter that transforms that into your view model, and the Apollo client itself actually returns your, um, your generated view models or, or your custom view models through some sort of like generic version of the Apollo client that you could inject an adapter into or something. So I, I think there's definitely some thought to be had there about how we can make it so the Apollo client supports and makes it easier for people to create their own custom structs. And I think that's the, the direction I'd like to see us go rather than trying to create a generated response data that is one size fits all. Yeah, we're, de we're definitely having uh, a lot of discussions around this. Poor Anthony, he, he started and I sent about 400 documents to him for him to read <laughs> uh, as, as soon as he got started. I was like, all right, let's, let's, let's see how that's going. Um, let's see, I, I wanna give a, a couple more of these questions here. So read the iOS client. Does Apollo have any recommendations about how consumers should be running the code gen during rapid iteration cycles? For example, as a component of the build phase for tests, for runs separately, or is it just user preference? Uh, generally, we recommend that you run it uh, as part of the, the build phase for running. Um, that's that is something where um, theoretically it should be going fast enough uh, in terms of the generation that that shouldn't really add that much time to your, your build phase. Uh, there's definitely some options in terms of where you can put that if, if, it's, if it's starting to slow things down. But um, in, in my experience, unless you've got an absolutely enormous, um, uh, unless you've got an absolutely enormous schema uh, and tons 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 of, of, of operations, uh, it, it isn't that, um, it isn't that, uh, that, that, that time consuming. Um, I have some uh, Martin, about that. 
<laughs> uh, Tell us your opinions, Anthony. Sorry. I, so I think at Salesforce, we didn't do that. And we, we started off doing that, um, which worked great for a while. But as you said, eventually, if your GraphQL operations get to be very large, what we ended up doing was creating just a script that called into the code generation. And I set up a Xcode behavior that you could put on a keyboard shortcut. So just like if you hit command B at build generation, if you hit command you know, whatever you want to put as your keyboard shortcut, you can just have it run the code generation then. And I found that we really only need to run code generation after our GraphQL query object or operations. And I, it, it saved, you know, three or four seconds every time you hit command B by doing that. Yeah, I think um, one thing that we're definitely looking at for for the iOS code generation uh, changes that we're working on is uh, potentially a better way to sort of be able to short circuit when there aren't any changes in uh, the the GraphQL files. Um, that's definitely something that we we want to work on just to just to sort of say, okay, if this hasn't that changed, awesome. then we don't need to change anything. So um, that's definitely something that we're 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 looking into, and that would that would definitely make it much more plausible to keep that in the build phase uh, rather than sort of doing its own thing. Um, I've seen a question in here a couple of times. Do we have any plans for Xamarin? Uh, no, <laughs> that's, a, that's a quick one. Um, right now, so let's, let's talk a little bit about where you can use, um, where you can use each of the two uh, uh, libraries that we have. So for iOS, you can use it with, uh, with or for, for Apollo iOS, like you can use it with obviously iOS, uh, but you can use it for uh, watch OS and TV OS and Mac OS. Um, we've got a contributor uh, who's working potentially on getting some support for Linux. That's maybe easier said than done. Uh, it is something that I would love to support eventually, but right now we don't really have the bandwidth to do it internally. Um, uh, and um, so uh, that is a little bit unfortunate. Uh, and then Apollo Android, there's a there's a sort of tongue-in-cheek question. Will Android be dropped from the name once it also runs on server, JVM, iOS, and web JS via Kotlin multi-platform? Uh, <laughs> what do you think about that, Martin? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I, I, at some point, I considered doing something like Apollo Kotlin and just doing a redirect to Apollo Android, uh, because Apollo Android really uh, is mostly Kotlin, I, and I, I think a lot of people uh, just don't expect that because they see Android. But uh, yeah, it, it runs. It, it even runs on uh, JavaScript right now. If you um, not the runtime, but if you just want parsing and generated models. Uh, you can have that uh, in the browser, so which is pretty crazy when you think about it. Yeah, is that through Kotlin so, multi-platform? Yeah, yeah. Cool. Yeah, I'm. I, I I will admit that I'm extremely excited about Kotlin multi-platform. Um, this this is something where, as someone who does both iOS and Android, I, I'm definitely much more excited about it than other options. Um, uh, and I think uh, there's some really, really interesting opportunities there. So I'm really, really, really glad uh, to see how excited uh, 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 Marta and the rest of the Android team are uh, are are about that. Um, uh, let's see, we do have one more question again about another uh, another framework. Uh, what about Flutter? As of right now, we do not have plans to support Flutter, but if you're interested, just definitely keep letting us know. Uh, obviously, you know, we, we have uh, a little bit of bandwidth uh, uh, for, for what we want to do, but I think, uh, you know, Flutter, Flutter comes in in an in interesting place just because it, it is, you, you do need to do everything in Dart. Um, and I think that's, that's, that's got some, some, some interesting, uh, interesting things going on there. Um, let's see. So I want to do a quick go around while we're waiting for some more questions. Um, I want to I want to ask everyone, what are you most excited about uh, that's coming up for um, for the the mobile SDKs? So, uh, Mark Tyne, why don't you uh, why don't you? Uh, sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm 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 not working full time on um, Apollo iOS right now. Um, yep. But one of the projects that um, I did work on and um, that I think we're um, um, getting ready to get into a release at some point is uh, replacing the um, the current code gen front end, which requires um, installing Node and running the Apollo CLI uh, with a very lightweight implementation that runs um, 
in JavaScript core, um, which means that it's much faster. It doesn't have any external dependencies. And um, it also makes it much easier for our team to iterate on it, which is really important um, because we're um, we're in the process, um, as Anthony mentioned, of, of reconsidering um, the uh, the way we generate code and the code we generate. Cool. Yeah, I think. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, the... maybe another thing to mention, um, which is something that we already did ship, um, is um, as some of you may have um, may have been aware of um, Apollo iOS used to have um, its own promise implementation that was used internally and quite a complicated um, sort of concurrency model um, and um, we um, we completely we threw that out and greatly simplified uh, simplified the the concurrency model which um, makes it a lot easier for us to reason about the code makes it more correct and um, Surprisingly, also more performant, um, or perhaps surprisingly. <laughs> yeah, I think that was that. That was the thing that the, the amount to which it was more performant sur surprised me. Um, I think I think it's a it's a good example of um, you know what what premature optimization can actually cost you. Um, yep. You know, I th I think there's there's uh, I, I think it was what about four x faster uh, in certain circumstances. Uh, when we when we weren't like sending everything off onto like twenty three different threads, um, so it's it's definitely something where um, I feel like we've learned some really good lessons about that in terms of where to w when to sort of concentrate on that that kind of optimization. Um, let's see, Anthony, what are what are you most excited about coming up? Um, thanks. Yeah, I think that what I'm most excited about is really all of the new things that are going to be enabled by redoing the code generation. Uh, you know, Martin was talking about how we're decoupling from Node, but another part of that process is that it's giving the iOS team a lot more control over the future of the um, the IR that we have, the intermediate representation that we get. So when we compile your GraphQL uh, schema and all of your query operations to generate all of the, the data structs, we have this internal representation that's created that gives us kind of like an AP over what all the fields are and what's needed there. And we've been using a common Apollo representation for quite a while. And by giving us more control over that, it allows us to add in new features. It allows us to maybe create um, like local directives that are custom to alter the code gen. It allows us to do a lot more things with the code gen going forward. So I'm excited to get a just basic structure for the code gen done more so because it gives us so much um, foundational ability to just add new functionality and features. And I, I hope to really involve the community at that point and allow the community to contribute to creating more options for code generation that fit the needs they have. Um, there are ideas around like a directive for property wrappers where you could have a certain field in your query be um, be annotated with a property wrapper in Swift. So you can create your own custom property wrappers that give your fields, you know, functionality of their own. There are a lot of concepts of what we could do with different directives and stuff once we have a more flexible code gen. And I'm really excited for that. Yeah. And I think related to that, I'm excited about that because it means that, uh, in order to change things about the code generation, I don't have to dive back down into TypeScript, uh, which I am uh, scared of and bad at, probably in a related fashion. <laughs> um, so uh, 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 Martin, why don't you uh, tell us what you're most excited about for, for the Android SDK? Yeah, so, so same as the others, uh, like Anthony said, I think there's a lot of uh, nice stuff we can do with uh, custom directives. Something I would really like to do, I have no idea how to do, but I think would be very nice is how to handle uh, relay connections and, uh, and pagination. I think this is a pain point uh, of uh, a lot of apps. Um, in terms of uh, what's coming and what I'm working on right now, uh, I'm mostly excited about performance. Uh, I spent a bunch of time recently uh, optimizing every millisecond out of uh, network parsing and database fetching, and uh, we have uh, good progress there. So uh, I'm looking forward for this to ship. That's awesome. Um, 
Yeah, I, there's a sort of related question. Uh, it seems that iOS and Android do bo both do their own things in terms of features, roadmap, et cetera. Is there any plan to better synchronize and plan the roadmaps? So I think I wanna, I wanna throw back a little bit to where things started with iOS and Android uh, and, and sort of where they've been going over the last couple of years. Um, because uh, Martin, you said that you, you, you joined Apollo six months ago, but you actually joined the Apollo uh, uh, maintenance team for, for Android well before that, because um, we've had we've had a really strong open source maintenance team uh, for Apollo Android um, that's really done a great job of moving that project forward. Um, initially, without a whole lot of of help or direction from Apollo, and now we're trying now we're we're trying to actually be like, oh yeah, we should we should probably support that. Um, and so we're we're really excited to have um, uh, Martin on board and and hopefully get some more uh, Android folks on board uh, soon as well. Um, you know, iOS. I think one of the things that um, one of the things that's happened is that we we have uh, fallen a little bit to the side of where Android has, um, just because we just haven't had as many people working on it. Um, you know, this, this has been, this is, this, this has been, uh, something that I've been working with since I started is just sort of like trying to, trying to play catch up while, uh, while the Android team just runs way out in front, <laughs> uh, which, uh, you know, for me as an iOS developer is, is not something I'm used to. I'm used to, I, I'm used to sort of, uh, the the opposite being the case, but it's been really interesting um, to to see how that goes. Um, but I think um, I, I definitely feel like we want to get more aligned on, uh, particularly the caching, um, uh, the use of the 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 normalized cache. I know that there's a lot of thought around that, um, and then we're also looking at um, some things in code generation in terms of what is worth lining up on and what isn't. Um, I think there's there's some stuff where our um, you know, there's some stuff where where there's differences in the languages um, and differences in some of the idioms where lining things up completely doesn't necessarily make sense. Um, but particularly for the cache, I think that's something where like that's essentially an entirely an invention of Apollo. Uh, and I think that that's something where um, we can really uh, be working on on making that uh, more aligned. So there there is definitely plans for that, but it's uh, yeah, there's <laughs> there's a lot of work ahead of us. Um, yeah, uh, let's see, uh, yeah, uh, non-tech question, how is Apollo development funded? That's a good question. Um, so yeah, Apollo GraphQL is a company, uh, people, people pay us for, for, uh, our services. Um, and then, uh, Apollo pays, uh, the four of us, uh, for our services. Um, we also, uh, we have plenty of opportunities for uh, folks to contribute uh, as well. I know that we've, we've uh, partnered with, um, with, with different uh, uh, folks that are using our SDK in the past, and we'll continue to partner with people in the future uh, to, to try to add stuff. Um, you know, this is, this is a big piece of why we're open source. We're, we're very uh, interested in building stuff with the community. Um, and, uh, I know, um, that's a big piece for me of, of what some of the code gen changes on iOS are, are, are about, because I think this has been something that I've seen be really successful for Android is that because all of their code generation is in Kotlin, um, they're able, or at least some of it was in Java for a while, but it's at least in a language that the people who are writing the applications actually know. Um, and, uh, I, I think that's one thing that I'm really excited about with the changes to um, the 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 iOS SDK, so that we can get more people uh, helping us work on making the the generated code better, and also the consumption of the generated code. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see. Yeah, if you've got any more questions, throw them in. We probably got about ten more minutes left. Um, and let's see. So uh, I think. Uh, I want to ask a little bit about uh, how people have been enjoying uh, some of these new declarative UI uh, uh, things like uh, Swift UI and Jetpack Compose, because um, I know that that's obviously a big um, topic in both uh, iOS and Android. Um, Martin, have you been working with uh, Swift UI at all, or? Um. 
I've, I've I've used it in a few personal projects, but um, but nothing nothing real. Um, and I haven't actually um, used it with GraphQL yet. Cool. Yeah, uh, Anthony, how about you? I have not gotten a great chance to work with SwiftUI in anything production-wise yet, um, but I've done a lot of thinking about it, and I think that GraphQL really uh, is, is structured in a way that works very, very well with SwiftUI and is, is naturally kind of a great pairing. Um, we need to get to a point where we're building some better features for SwiftUI absolutely into our framework. Um, and my goal is, again, as we said over and over, once we have this new version of the code gen out, it's going to be so much more flexible. And my goal is to be able to create um, much better data structures that can be coupled with you know, individual Swift UI components. Um, we can use fragments possibly so that you have a certain like GraphQL query fragment that is coupled uh, straight to a specific Swift UI reusable component and you can plug that in and use it just from any query. Um, I think that there's a lot of opportunities to do really cool stuff there and I'm really excited to explore that world, but we need to really get code gen to a point flexible and, um, and, and all this stuff too. And at that point, possibly create different types of code generations. You could choose different options for code gen based on a framework you're using. Yeah, and I think um, you know this is definitely something where we're looking at what are some ways that we might be able to provide support for things like identifiable um, and other ways to make sure that um, we uh, make it easy to interact with the system APIs uh, for 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 iOS. Um, Martin, how about uh, Jetpack Compose? I'm super excited, uh, especially like Anthony said. I think there are similarities between. I'm not uh, the frameworks, but the concept behind uh, Jetpack Compose and GraphQL. I mean, on one side, you have a graph of UI elements. On the other side, you have your graph of data. And I think uh, putting them together makes a lot of sense. So I'm really looking forward to, to bridging that gap. Also, because I've been doing Android since Cupcake, and I cannot wait to ditch that old view API that has evolved into a, a monster beast of uh, like th there was this meme recently where uh, President Joe Biden was having a, the, the, I think a, a huge book, and uh, he was uh, I don't know how you say you say oh it. yeah the 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 Bible that he that he was sworn in on, and yeah. and people are like oh what is, what is this book wrong answers only. <laughs> Uh, and one of the answer was it was view.java uh, part one and uh, <laughs> this is exactly uh, I think that that file is uh, several thousands of lines long um, maybe tens of thousands of lines long and uh, it, it's it's yeah. high time to to get rid of that yeah I I that's always a hard thing when you're working when you're working with some of these legacy APIs where just stuff has been bolted on and bolted on and bolted on and bolted on and then you're just like how did this get so huge it's just unreal um so we got a, a couple of questions around combined support for iOS. Um, I, I can say that there's a, a community package. Uh, I'll try to dig up the link and, and throw it into Twitch. There is a community package that does offer uh, combined bindings for, for iOS. Um, right now, we're still supporting uh, iOS 12 uh, under the hood. And so um, for me, I think one of the bigger advantages of going to combine is that there's there's some major, major improvements under the hood that we're going to be able to make uh, once once we're able to use combine completely. But I think that's that's going to be something where um, that will be probably after the 1.0 ships. Um, and I, th I, I think we sort of have some more fundamental issues to, to deal with. And honestly, like, at the at the speed that I'm seeing things going, I feel like it's likely that we'll be able to actually move to combine internally at the same time as we're able to actually take some time to focus on on supporting it externally. Um, and yeah, so that's that's pretty exciting. Uh, another couple of questions uh, we've had about are about pagination. Um, yeah, we're we are very aware on the iOS side that that could probably be better. Um, uh, that's definitely one of the the major uh, things that we want to try try to get into a better place for the 1.0. Um, and then, um, Martel, you said something about uh, you, you're working on that for uh, Android as well. Is that correct? 
uh, working not right now. I mean, it's a background process. Uh, I know it's a pain point for a lot of uh, people, and I would really love to to improve that situation. Uh, I think part of it is uh, to get the cogen right first. Like we need good foundations before we we start uh, diving into pagination. Um, but we'll get there, and uh, really, this is uh, yeah, this is re- definitely something uh, that I'm thinking about. Yeah, and yeah, I think I'm, one of the I'm things. Are... Of... Oh. Go ahead, Anthony. Sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say nope. I'm seeing a lot of questions in the chat about um, a lot of different features, talking about pagination, talking about combine and Swift UI, talking about um, you know uh, different p- parts of the code gen. And I'm really excited. I've only been here for two. This is my third week with Apollo, and all of the things that the community is asking about and talking about here are things that we already have had conversations about just in the last two weeks. And we don't have solutions for any of these problems yet. We haven't you know, built an implementation plan, but it's really validating and it's, it's great to see that the things that the community is concerned about and wanting from us are a lot of the same things that we've been talking about internally. Um, and, and I really hope that we continue to be on the right, you know, the right track there and understanding what the community needs. And the only way we're going to do that is to continue to get engagement from the community. But it's really validating to hear that like the things that we're talking about already are the things that everyone is hoping we get. <laughs> Yeah, I, I I think that's been um, this this was something that was really great in the the iOS developer survey this year um, was that sort of last year uh, we had a lot of um, a, a lot of uh, things of sort of like people seeing different purposes for the library than than we necessarily saw and people having really really different experiences with how it was working. Um, some people it was working great and some people were like, this is terrible. What are you even doing? Um, this year we got much more consistent feedback in terms of what people are expecting, what people are looking to improve. And it's also consistent with like what we're excited about improving. So I think I, I'm really excited about that. Um, let's see, Martin, we got a quick question. What is the progress of the Kotlin multi-platform efforts? So we're getting there. Um, actually, uh, the current version in production, so version 2.5, supports multi-platform. Uh, it supports queries, mutations, subscriptions. It is working. You get uh, the generated models and parsers as well. Uh, the big missing part is the cache, uh, which we are working on. This will be in Apollo 3.0. Um, that's mostly it, I would say. What else? Yeah. Yeah, I, I've uh, so I helped out on the the sample iOS app for multi-platform um, when we got that up and running, and yeah, like I I was really happy with how easy that was to get up and running even before. Um, you know, dealing with any of the stuff around the cache that's going to be dealt with in 3.0. Um, I, I definitely, like I said, I'm personally biased because I'm very excited about um, Kotlin multi-platform, but I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be really, really, uh, really, really helpful for for everybody. Um, yeah, there, there are let's... a lot of details about like concurrency and stuff that will make interacting with the cache, especially like a database, a bit more complex or. So... Uh, this is what we are investigating at the moment, how we can uh, basically make all the database accesses from a thread, which is why it's taking a bit of time, but we, we will get there. Yeah, it's the, 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 the threading stuff in Kotlin multi-platform. It's gotten much better in the last little bit, but uh, it is not simple. Uh, and it's, it's definitely something where um, uh, Kevin Galligan has, I think, a small uh, a, a, a small, a small empire built on. Uh, here's yep. how. Here's how to explain how all of the the that functionality works. Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> somebody, somebody just said freeze all the things, and that is absolutely correct. Uh, but yeah, it's it's definitely really interesting. Um, let's see. I think we've got probably about five minutes left. Um, and let's see. Uh, Let's see. I want to ask, sort of, um, you know, what are some what are some things that each of you has run across that is has been really the most helpful for like wrapping your head around GraphQL? Um, you know, either sort of documentation or blog posts or videos. Um, so I want to I want to sort of see what what. Uh, if you guys have anything that that you would recommend, so uh, Martin, let's start with you. 
Yeah, that, that's a tough question. I, um, I've been sort of involved with GraphQL for so long that for me, um, like w w when we started out, there wasn't any, any sort of introductory content. Um, so we've been sort of reading and interpreting the spec and writing things as we go. Um, so I, I don't think I have great pointers to sort of introductory documentation. I, I would actually recommend people um, to take a look at the spec. I, I know it looks daunting, um, like especially all the sort of pseudo pseudo code in there, uh, the, the, the detailed sort of algorithms that describe how GraphQL is executed. Um, but it, it is very helpful to know what is going on under the hood um, and to take a look at like the different validation rules and, and, and the way the type system has been set up. Um, because GraphQL is a language that um, sort of starts out pretty simple, um, and that's the intention. Like you write a query um, that is structurally similar to the response you're getting, um, but you can quickly get into situations where um, that correspondence breaks down. Um, like you have your inline fragments with type conditions, and um, you have your named fragments that you spread out, and you have your include and skip uh, directives that you can use to sort of decide what information um, gets included. Um, and when you don't have a very good mental model of sort of the, the, the way GraphQL execution proceeds, um, the way sort of fields are merged, for instance, that is one of the fundamental principles of GraphQL execution that um, you can actually ex include the same field um, from multiple places for instance, including the same field from multiple fragments and any subselections will be merged. Um, that is something that um, is really important to, to understand and also the interaction with the type system if you if you really want to want to understand what's going on. So I, I, I completely get it. The, the graphical spec is not an easy read, but um, if you're into these, ty these types of things, it's, it's, it's worth it. Yeah, I think I think that's a that's a good recommendation. It is it is a little dense. I'm not going to lie, but it it is definitely something that I have been I, I have been able to to get some use some really helpful information out of. Um, let's see, Anthony. I know you uh, you've been more working as a as a consumer of the iOS SDK uh, until about three weeks ago. So, uh, do you have any particular recommendations around that? Well, I learned GraphQL at Facebook. Very, very, very different because they have their own private implementation of GraphQL. Um, and then I had to relearn quite a lot of it when I went over <laughs> to Salesforce um, and started using Apollo. But I honestly, I think that the Apollo documentation is excellent. Uh, the graphql.org just learn page that gives you just the basic introduction is really, really concise and intelligent and tells you everything you need to know. And of course, the Apollo Odyssey tutorials are really, really good also. Um, what I've actually struggled to find so far, I think, is good guidance on how to build really well-architected GraphQL API and schemas. Um, I see so many, you know, as a client consumer, we see so we are consuming in GraphQL API, but I see so many odd choices being made about nullability, about use of unions or interfaces in creating your Apollo schema. And I would really love to see from you know, from Apollo and from the community, more um, tutorials out there that really kind of talk about the philosophy of design of a GraphQL schema. I've seen one, one of the biggest problems I see, I think, is people using unions where they should probably be interfaces in creating their GraphQL schemas, and I would and and it makes it a lot harder for clients to consume. So I would really love to see more stuff like that. And I, I don't have the answer to that question. So if anyone has any really good um, to resources out there, I would love to post them in the chat. We would love to see what resources are out there to help people make better decisions about creating great GraphQL. Yeah, and I think we can also, we'll also chat with uh, uh, our fine friends in DX about some of that stuff. Um, and uh, Martin, how about you? Um, yeah, so this, I, I think for me, it's mostly the tooling and, and this is how I got started with, uh, with GraphQL. Um, it's nice because it's all uh, strongly typed. And uh, since I'm a Kotlin lover, I love uh, types and uh, type systems. And it, it felt really natural uh, to use uh, graphical and uh, and stuff like Studio, where you can have autocomplete everywhere. Uh, 
Th this makes uh, diving into GraphQL uh, super easy. So I don't know if, of, of course, uh, like Martin says, the, the, the spec is super good and I definitely recommend that. But um, to be honest, uh, as starters, like just having some um, interactive uh, interface where you can type your queries and have your result, have your documentation online, like this is super precious. And I, I think this is this is what makes GraphQL so, so unique and this is what makes it so so nice to use uh, in, in my in my mind yeah i definitely agree I, I i really enjoy using both um graphical which is which is built into a lot of servers and then uh we have our our apollo studio uh tool that that you can register for and and get a lot of fun goodies uh in terms of uh what you can what you can do in terms of constructing queries and, and getting information it's really pretty fun. Um, but uh, it, I, I think, honestly, one of the things that helped me wrap my head around GraphQL the most was just playing with it. Um, you know, being able to see how changing a query would change the res response, um, how everything um, working together uh, would, 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 would be able to, to to give me back what I wanted, uh, rather than more more than what somebody else wanted, um, and that's a good plug for my talk later. <laughs> uh, I, I'm doing a talk uh, later on about uh, GraphQL from the ground up that talks about some of this stuff, um, and I think we're about out of time. Um, but I I wanted to uh, just let everybody have uh, uh, one last thing, uh, if you would if you're interested. Um, any any, any uh, parting words? of advice uh let's see we'll go around uh, clockwise again so uh martin um words of advice in in, in general like life advice or <laughs> specific to <laughs> apollo mobile probably specific to apollo, apollo mobile let's 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 keep it a little bit narrower <laughs> yeah um sure i mean i i i would i would say um Schema design is definitely something that um, you probably want to be involved in as a as a client team. Um, that's something we often see sort of happen in organizations that have a more traditional uh, division of roles, where you have sort of your server team and they um, they expose an API and then you're supposed to use it. Um, while the power of GraphQL is really sort of empowering product developers, uh, empowering client developers. So, um, if your organization has any way for you to get involved in, in sort of, um, deciding the shape of your, of your schema, um, definitely make sure that, that that schema is actually something that you want to consume and that, that addresses your needs. Yeah, that's 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 a great piece of advice. Uh, I, we also have several requests for Martine to give life advice. So, uh, Martine, any 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 life advice you want to share? Um, I mean, I'm currently um, like growing 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 my beard and growing my hair because um, I can't get a haircut. Um, I um, <laughs> wouldn't advise that. Um, but during the last lockdown, I decided to um, shave off everything. Um, and that definitely wasn't something I would um, I would advise anyone to do. Um, <laughs> like children around me no longer recognized me. My phone would no longer recognize me. Um, and I was basically back to where I was like ten years ago. So don't do that. Yeah, that's at least at least in the Netherlands, uh, you don't you don't have people uh, uh, asking you for your your ID to to see if uh, you're 21 uh, when when you try to order a beer. Um, <laughs> Cool. Uh, Anthony, any, any parting words you want to share? Um, I, I mean, not necessarily Apollo specific, but I think my general advice to software engineers is learn test-driven development and use it. It makes your life so much better once you figured it out. Um, and I just, on every team I've ever been on, I try to push people to do test-driven development all the time. Um, I also just want to say thank you to everyone who came and, and Listen to us and asked us wonderful questions today. I know there were a couple of questions we didn't get to yet. Um, my biggest Apollo advice would be get engaged with the community, get engaged with us, get engaged with the open source community. If you have features you want in Apollo that don't exist yet, 
please talk to us about getting involved and helping us implement them. We would love to have the community more involved in this stuff. And if you have questions that didn't get answered today, feel free to reach out to us on GitHub. Feel free to tweet any of us. We'd love to answer your questions and, and keep you guys involved and keep you guys knowing what's going on. Um, as we get through this code gen stuff, I want us to become much more transparent in the roadmap um, once we kind of solve some of these core issues. And I, I really just, my advice is get involved with the community. If you're using Graph or using Apollo, you are going to be much more successful if you know what's going on and you have your voice heard in how we implement features going forward. Yes, I will agree with that. And I, I will I will also say please please use betas because uh, <laughs> uh, if you if you have any opportunity to give feedback on, on a beta, it is super, super helpful for us. Um, and uh, it helps us find issues before they go to everyone. So please. Love you guys. Uh, finally, uh, Martin, uh, any any yeah, parting uh, parting I, I won't take long because I was going to say exactly the same. Please give us feedback and we have a uh, a dev version, or not a dev version yet, but uh, we are starting to roll out a um, development version of the 3.0 branch. So right now it's snapshot. So if you get an opportunity to try it out and give us feedback, everything is super unstable and moves super fast, but uh, you will get a chance to look at the, the early APIs. And this is all available in, uh, in Maven snapshots. So if you get an opportunity, please try it out and send us feedback. Would love to hear awesome. that. Yeah, and uh, I, I will also just say, like, uh, <laughs> I, I've sort of joked that 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 uh, our feedback process is, why don't you just tell me what you want me to build? Um, but it, there is a certain point at which the only way that we know that 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 y'all want something to happen is is for you to tell us about it. Uh, so so we would love to hear your feedback, good and bad, um, and we'd we'd really love to to be able to build some cool stuff with you. Um, well. Guys, thanks so much for coming out today. Uh, I know that it's pretty late uh, in Europe and pretty early on the West Coast. So uh, I appreciate everybody coming out today. Um, thank you so much. And uh, I'll talk to you all later on. Thanks, Alan. Thank you, everyone. Bye.